Okay, so why don't we get started? Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to today's literary Zoom lecture brought to you by Walter Library. And a special welcome to our waitlisted guests who are watching through our YouTube live stream. I'm Michael Bellicosa, Community Engagement Manager here at the library. I'm very pleased to be introducing this lecture. Uh, the series has been wonderful. Unfortunately, this is the last one in this series. It's been great. And I want to thank our donors who helped make these uh, lectures and all of our programs possible, and especially uh, the support of the literary series in memory of Amy Quigley. Uh, before we begin, a few notes. Most of you have heard this three other times. Your mics and your cameras are off. So please keep them that way during the program. And because we have a large audience, uh, the way we'll handle the Q&A, as in the last few weeks, is that you can send me a question in the chat box and I'll relay that to Mark after his lecture is uh, concluded. Uh, also, Mark is happy to answer questions that you can email him directly um, after the lecture. I just wanna mention one other program note that in two weeks, Mark will be back on Saturday afternoon, October 31, to give us a lecture on F. Scott Fitzgerald and his work during the 20s uh, through the lens of the jazz age. So with that, I will now turn this over to Mark and Ulysses. Mark. Turn your mic on, Mark. Thanks. Uh, I confess that each time I uh, hear that intro, Michael, I expect that when you say a special welcome to those people uh, on the waiting room or wherever they are, I always expect you to say our men and women serving overseas. Uh, okay. So uh, this is our last of four, and in completing this four-part series today, uh, Ulysses in the context of Homer's Odyssey, I want to do three things this afternoon. First, to discuss briefly the last three of the novel's 18 chapters, called collectively the nostoi, the homecoming, that Greek word is where we get our word nostalgia, uh, discuss those three chapters with respect to Homa, Homer, then outline the meta aspects of the novel, that is the M-E-T-A. That's just a Greek word meaning the self-referential. Uh, a meta movie is a movie that is aware that it's a movie. Uh, the TV show, The Office, is sometimes called a meta TV because they know they're being filmed by a crew and so on. So it's, it's just a way of talking about uh, self-awareness on the part of the work of art as a work of art. So to look at how those episodes and techniques in the novel continually remind us that we're reading a book and explore a little bit what those techniques contribute to Ulysses and end by underscoring that for all its self-referential nature and for all its apparently self-indulgence on Joyce's part of his extraordinary knowledge of English literature and Irish culture, Ulysses inhabits and extends the great tradition of the British novel in its celebration of both the power of art and the poignancy of human nature. Um, that phrase is one I'd like you to keep in your mind because I do think that's the twin accomplishment uh, of the novel. It reminds us of the power of art and the poignancy of human nature. The trio of episodes that concludes Joyce's novel begins with chapter 16, Eumaeus, which parallels book 14 of the Odyssey, in which Odysseus, having returned secretly to Ithaca, rests in the dwelling of his swineherd Eumaeus, whom we are told, quote, cared the most for his master's worldly goods. So it's a very intimate reunion, even though the long absent king continues to keep his identity hidden from the swineherd. The book dramatizes both the reunion of the master and the servant, the king and the subject, and also the reestablishment of what might be called the domestic normative of the epic, a celebration of the foundations of human life and civilization that are located in the home. Uh, you'll remember if you attended the lectures uh, on the Odyssey that that's a central point in my view of Homer's epic. If I do return sometime to talk about the Iliad, we'll see how that notion 
of the foundations of human life and civilization are enacted by men away from home uh, and at war. In Joyce's chapter, Eubaeus, Bloom, who has followed an impaired Stephen out of the brothel in chapter 15, takes him to a cabman's shelter that parallels the swineherd's hut. During their time together, Bloom acts as a combination good Samaritan and father figure to the young artist who denies his own relationship with his father, whom he describes to the inquiring sailor, D.B. Murphy, who asks him, are you related to Stephen Dedalus? Have you heard of him? Stephen characterizes the man who he disowns as his father, he doesn't acknowledge a relationship, as being all too Irish, uh, by which Stephen and Joyce mean his alcoholism at the minimum. Well, in the chapter, the not all too Irish Bloom counsels Stephen to distance himself from Mulligan, to try to drink less, and to be careful on any future trips to the women of ill fame in Nighttown, the red light district of Dublin. That is to say, he acts as a kind of father figure, Bloom, who is still grieving over the loss of his young son, Rudy, uh, serves as a kind of, or offers to serve as a kind of surrogate father uh, to Stephen, to make Stephen a true Telemachus. He also suggests uh, that Stephen, in Bloom's words, just come home with me and talk things over and have some cocoa. In chapter 17, Ithaca, the pair enter Bloom's home on Eccles Street after Bloom, who is keyless, that's Joyce's word, keyless like Stephen, climbs through a basement level window. In this way, the indirect entrance to his own home, uh, coming in like an outside insider, parallels Odysseus' return to his own palace as a wayworn stranger. He disguises himself as an outsider, even though he's an insider. And that happens in the Odyssey in book 17. So returning to Ulysses, they drink cocoa as Bloom without success, invites Stephen to stay the night and considers whether he might be interested, Stephen, uh, in seeing uh, Millie, his daughter. And so Bloom has not just invited the young artist into his home uh, and then to stay overnight, but possibly thinks of inviting him into his family. But Stephen, no Telemachus, turns away from the surrogate father as he has his own father, and departs Seven's Eccles Street as the bells in the Church of St. George, notably a Protestant church, uh, no Irish church, uh, I can't say that, but it'd be, it'd be surprising for Joyce to invoke uh, a church with the name of St. George, the patron saint of England, uh, as an Irish church. So as the bells peal, the hour of the night, it's about two o'clock in the morning, the sound of it makes Stephen think of the Catholic prayer for the dying, while Bloom thinks, hi ho, hi ho. Now, hi ho can mean many different things, but it's not associated with dying. It can be a, a, a suggestion to move on or pick up your spirit, uh, especially if you're uh, uh, in the company of Snow White, or, or it can mean a kind of comment about ho hum, ho hum, uh, kind of boredom. Either way, it's quite different from the association that Stephen has with the bells, which is another reason why this death suffused individual is not an adequate person for the novel. The novel's on the side of life. After Stephen's departure, which is effectively his second and final one in the novel, the novel got rid of him, you'll remember, at the end of chapter three, he returns for a part of it but this is the second and final departure. Bloom reviews the events of the day and sees evidence in his home of Boylan's earlier presence. Critics have suggested that Bloom's bumping into rearranged furniture is channeling Ulysses having a stool throw out, thrown at him by one of the rivals. Uh, it's certainly true that Joyce would be capable of that kind of quiet connection. 
Gloom lies down in bed as Molly awakens with his feet at her head and vice versa, an image of what the chapter calls the dissimilar similarity, uh, kind of yin yang. And uh, the rest of the novel, especially in Penelope, Penelope explores some of the parallel oppositions, again, of these two characters, uh, man and woman, and many other aspects of dissimilar similarity. Bloom kisses her buttocks and notes that it's been a decade since they've had sexual intercourse. Penelope, Joyce's name for the 18th and final chapter of the novel, parallels the penultimate book of Homer's epic, which Fagel's in the translation that I used, entitles The Great Rooted Bed, where that bed serves as both the revelation of Odysseus' identity, because he knows the secret of it, his wife recognizes him as her husband, but it's also the locus of the reunion of wife and husband. So uh, the epic of Homer does not just bring Ulysses home, but in this penultimate chapter brings him to his marriage bed. In Joyce, the chapter, which takes place almost completely with Molly in bed, she gets up to go to the bathroom. In Joyce, the chapter is composed of eight sentences, the first of which contains 2,500 words. And if you think that I counted them, I did not. Uh, I have that on the word of critics who know more about the novel than I do and begins and ends with the word yes, which Joyce reportedly called the most positive word in the English language. You could think that that's an obvious statement, but someone could say that assuredly or absolutely or yea verily or some other intensifier is a more positive word. It's like Joyce to say that the most elemental way to say yes is yes. So um, the idea that there are eight sentences, the idea that there is a looping back uh, to the word yes from the beginning to the end have led some commenters to say that Joyce is channeling the symbol of infinity. If you form an eight and turn it on its side, uh, you get the symbol for infinity. Um, some people have suggested that because Molly's chapter is not tied to clock time. There is no uh, paying attention uh, to the clock, uh, unlike every other chapter in the novel, and that she wanders freely in her own interior monologue over a terrain. Some people have gone so far to say that the reason the eight looks like an infinity sign when you turn it horizontally is because they're lying in bed. Now, I want to say you can outjoyce Joyce in your cleverness. Uh, the novel does invite that kind of thing. Uh, but I certainly think that the idea of infinity, of expansiveness, of no longer being bound by the clock that has dominated the entire novel, even if you didn't know the time scheme that Joyce supplied outside the novel to one of his colleagues. So as Stephen's stream of consciousness episode, the third chapter of the novel, Proteus, ended the Telemachiad opening of Ulysses. Molly's stream of consciousness episode ends her section, and of course the entire novel. So we don't have time in my less than four hours to show all the affinities, but stream of consciousness ends the first section of the novel and a very different, much more magnanimous, much uh, fuller and more humane a kind of stream of consciousness and Molly section. By contrast, Bloom, who is less self-involved and much more other directed than Stephen or Molly, has his section, the one that ends the weather, wanderings of Ulysses, Circe, suffused with drama and a cast of characters real and imagined, living and dead. So each, uh, character's ending of the section uh, is reflective in its style of that character. Also in the original version of the novel, stately plump Buck Mulligan, the first sentence of um, uh, uh, Telemachus, 
had an outsized S, a big bold S, which people understood to stand for Stephen, which was the subject of Stephen's own thinking, that is his self-centeredness. And that the second section, the wandering of Ulysses began with a uh, oversized M, Mr. Leopold Bloom, because the character that is um, the focus of the second long section in Bloom's mind is Molly, and that the P of the last three chapters that begins uh, preparatory to anything else, capital P, is for Poldy, the nickname that Molly uses for Leopold. And therefore, the outside character, Stephen, is self-involved and the married couple uh, are interested in each other. So Molly's remarkable interior monologue, not keyed to any clock time, nor to any genre of literature or style, provides a stark contrast to the question and answer format of the preceding chapter, Ithaca, where Ithaca is rigid and kind of technical in its language and uh, uh, impersonal, the way that a catechism would be or a Socratic dialogue, or if you remember everything you always wanted to know about sex and were afraid to ask, uh, this notion that a disembodied person is presenting what happened in a question and answer format. You couldn't get further away from that style when we turn to Penelope. Strikingly, the monologue begins and ends with an answer of yes, but no question. We understand the question when we read the entire passage, but we have an answer with no question. So then turning, that, that's my review of those uh, concluding three episodes relative to the Odyssey. But I wanna to turn to an aspect of Ulysses that is at least as important as its resonances with Homer and consider briefly its meta or self-referential nature. When we encounter Stephen, the stream of consciousness in Proteus chapter three, after the relatively normative narrative style of the novel's first two chapters, or when we meet the, uh, or enter the hallucinogenic drama of Circe, or engage with the intense interior interiority of Molly's monologue, which most readers at first find disorienting, if not outright annoying. In each of those cases, we are intensely aware that we are not reading a conventional novel precisely because we are continuing being reminded that we, we are reading a novel. I wanna say that again and try not to butcher it. We're intensely aware that we're not reading a conventional novel precisely because we are continually being reminded that we are reading a novel. That is, the great tradition of realistic fiction has a kind of unspoken contract between the author and the reader that we're reading something that approximates reality and that it's perfectly acceptable to get caught up, whether it's Austin or Dickens or James or Thackeray in the drama of the novel and forget that these are only characters on a page. That kind of contract is typically broken in the 20th century and certainly in the 21st. You can think of a novel like Atonement by Ian McEwan or Kate Atkinson's great novels, Life After Life or A God in Ruins, where those novels eventually reveal themselves to be partly novels about the novel itself. But in Joyce's day, it was strikingly new. Of course, Joyce has other ways uh, to call attention to the art, artifice of the novel, uh, the way in which it runs counter to the suspension of disbelief in, way that, in ways that it doesn't seem to be purporting a kind of fictional realism. In Aeolus, the seventh chapter, newspaper headlines are extracted from the spoken exchanges of the character. Typographically, the format of the novel channels the notion of a headline. Sirens, chapter 11, embodies an inventory of 60 musical motifs, complete uh, with an overture on the opening pages, 
and a concluding part from Bloom at the end. In Cyclops, the 12th chapter, Joyce presents 33 parodies of what the critic Don Gifford calls various pompous, sensational, or sentimental literary styles that reflect the thoughts, speech, and actions of the chapter's characters as they are speaking or thinking. Joy satirizes both Gertie McDowell and the voyeuristic Bloom in Norsicia, chapter 13, by means of a parody of a second-rate sentimental novel. Now, you may not have known this uh, because you didn't check a guidebook first, God bless you, uh, but if you were to return to have that chapter or think back, the degradation of the writing style is not Joyce nodding, it's his channeling the kind of literature that has this uh, girl who knows she's being watched and this man who knows she knows being watched and so on, uh, a parody of a second-rate sentimental novel. In Oxen of the Sun, possibly the hardest chapter in the book, chapter 14, Joyce recapitulates the evolution of the English language from Latin verse to the influence of contemporary American slang, uh, remarkable. And I've already mentioned the surrealistic drama form of Circe, chapter 15, and Joyce's nod, nod towards the catechistic method of instruction in the question and answer format of Ithaca, chapter 17. So that's seven of Ulysses' 18 chapters that are in some way or another self-referential by disrupting our expectation of normative fictional narration and gives us some other kind of self-conscious or self-referential literary twist. Given these extraordinary displays of Joyce's virtuosity and the nearly ever-present streams of consciousness in the novel, that is, even in very typically rendered chapters, it's, uh, un it's not unusual for a character to have a moment of stream of consciousness. Someone thinks something and you have to realize now you're inside of someone's head. Given all of that, it seems appropriate to ask, why did Joyce seem to go out of his way to make all this fuss and to do? Why did he make his novel so bloody hard to read? I think that's a fair question. And when I have taught Ulysses again to college students, but never in its entirety, I know better. Uh, I have raised that question in class and they are enthusiastic of saying, oh good, Schenker's come over to the dark side. He's like us, he doesn't know why it's so difficult. Some of those students have imagined that the answer is that Joyce was a kind of intellectual sadist or less extremely, enjoyed showing off. I think there's some truth to the latter part. Uh, but the answer, I think the real answer is at once more simple and more exhilarating. Joyce, like Stephen, earnestly believed um, that art should be transformative, that it should reveal the great truths in small things by means of what Joyce called epiphanies, uh, rendering visible something hidden and secret. It's originally uh, a word from uh, the Greek and is associated with a Christian doctrine, especially the revelation of the Christ child to the Magi, that is to the public world, uh, this showing off visibly something uh, that is religious, mystical, hidden, secret. Uh, Joyce typically takes that um, sort of arcane mystical idea and he renders it, applies it to everyday life. Uh, he believed that art should require us to engage with the unreality of reality. And if you don't know what I mean by the unreality of reality, turn on cable news anytime. And that it should go beyond both the merely journalistic record of things and the philosophical religious views of life by enacting the transcendental, the aspects of our life that seem to pull us higher, and the descendental, the opposite, in everyday life. Joyce believed all those things, 
that art should be transformative, that it should make us think about what we're doing, that we should think about reading a book when we're reading it. And so, as one critic said, reading Ulysses is never an issue of habituation. You can never say, okay, I got it now, I'm in the rhythm. Uh, I give this, this example to my students and my own children, that all of us have had the experience of going to the first time to a foreign film and having to deal with subtitles. And I know people, some of them in my family, who feel like that's too much like work, that they're going to the movies, again, you remember the movies, uh, to be entertained and not to do work. But if you do go to several movies that are captioned, uh, you experience that uh, retrospectively as forgetting that you had to read. In fact, you may remember the movie by remembering that the character spoke English, uh, by hearing English language in the accent of an Italian actress. Uh, you get over the oddness of it, even though in the beginning, it's difficult to read. In Joyce, I think even frequent readers of Ulysses, and I'm gonna estimate I've read the whole novel from beginning to end, maybe four or five times, but I've read chapters too many times uh, to admit, uh, you never get habituated to it because it's always a challenge to remind you what you're doing now is reading art. And that's an important thing for human beings to do. Related to this is my last point. Uh, I want to conclude this lecture and indeed my series of lectures. And let me say now that I'm hoping to end uh, before a little earlier than I usually do not because I have less to say, but because I'm hoping you might have more to ask. Uh, so um, I, I'll be ending a little bit earlier than my sort of uh, 3.50 or so concluding. So I wanna conclude this lecture and indeed the series of lectures by stretching, stressing that alongside the power of art, Ulysses put for, puts forth an epic depiction of the poignancy, the vulnerability, the humanity, of the people of Dublin, and by extension, all people. When the critic F.R. Levis, L-E-A-V-I-S, his dates are 1895 to 1978, published his very influential The Great Tradition in 1948, he identified Jane Austen, George Eliot, Henry James, and Joseph Conrad as the great English novelist, that's a quote, the great English novelist, because their work reflects a great moral seriousness and quote, a reverent openness before life. Uh, he did not include most of Dickens who he thought was cartoonish and the only novel into the 20th, 20th century that he was willing to add to that list was D.H. Lawrence who uh, as those of you who read, have read much of him, is earnest about uh, the moral dimension of physicality and sexuality. He's a kind of, uh, a kind of high priest of the sensual uh, in a very moral, serious way. Notably, in that collection, uh, in celebration of the tradition, great tradition of the English novel, Levis explicitly excluded James Joyce from that company saying that Ulysses represented not a new direction for fiction, but quote, a dead end. Remember, he's writing decades after Ulysses was published. He's writing in the 40s when Joyce and his masterpiece uh, are held in very high regard. Levis apparently could not gain sight of the humanity on display throughout the novel because perhaps he was confused or put off by Joyce's radical innovations in style and method. He's not the only significant person to dislike Ulysses. Uh, Virginia Woolf is on record more than once that although she thinks that uh, Joyce had a good idea and she herself used it uh, a single 24 hour roughly uh, day uh, set in a major European city, London for her, not Dublin, on a day in June, in Mrs. Dalloway, a masterpiece. What she didn't like about Joyce's novel is she, she thought it was degraded. Uh, she didn't like 
um, the descendental parts of it, uh, the, the below the conventional. And if you know anything about uh, Virginia Woolf's own life, her style, her writing style, um, her uh, sensibility, uh, it would have offended her to have a novel like that be considered great. So that humanity that, uh, that I'm saying is on display throughout the novel. We saw an example of that last week in the painfully poignant scene between Stephen and his sister Dilly in The Wandering Rocks, chapter 10, uh, that I read at the end of my third lecture. We recognize uh, it also, that humanity, in Stephen's question to himself early on in Proteus, where he says to his own self in his head, what is that word known to all men? It's the kind of passage that if you're reading the novel closely and assiduously, you make a note on to say, got to find out what that's all about. Uh, in that passage where he's thinking about philosophy, it's implicitly tied to the teachings of the philosopher St. Thomas Aquinas, uh, distinction between kinds of love. And the question comes up again in Scylla and Charybdis, the ninth chapter, where Stevens interrupts his own dissertation on Shakespeare with an aside to himself that appears to temporarily puncture his own pomposity. And before I read that question, if you remember that chapter, he's both full of himself and terribly worried, lacking in confidence that this elaborate theory makes any sense. And in the course of the chapter uh, set in the library, he swings both ways, which is typical of him. So he says to himself, he interrupts himself with a stream of consciousness comment. Do you know what you're talking about? Uh, this thing about Shakespeare's plays. Uh, love, yes, word known to all men. Now that's not really an answer. That's just a reference. Uh, instead of explaining what love is, he connects it mysteriously to the idea in Thomas Aquinas, word known to all men. And his library bound discussion of Shakespeare and his reference to himself to St. Thomas Aquinas is as much removed from life as so much of Stephen's actions and thinking. More strikingly, in Circe, chapter 15, Stevens puts the question not to himself, but to the uh, apparition of his dead mother, who we're told has a face worn and noseless. Tell me the word mother, if you know now, the word known to all men. As if he's one of the characters from the Odyssey who thinks that he will gain insight into life from someone who now inhabits the realms of the dead. But tellingly, Stephen withheld love from his mother in denying uh, the request she made of him from her deathbed that he pray for her soul. That denial informs the end of portrait and it's the catalyst for Stephen leaving Ireland, presumably never to return, but he comes back for her funeral not long after. And of course, it broods over the entire uh, Stephen section of uh, Stephen sections of Ulysses. Um, he withheld love from his mother in denying the request she made of him from her deathbed that he pray for her soul. And apparently Joyce and his brother Stanislaus did that same denial. Of course, there's little evidence of a loving Stephen anywhere in the novel, which is part of the point. It's not surprising that he would bring up the question of the word known to all men in the first instance without naming what the word is and having it derived <laughs> Uh, from St. Thomas Aquinas. By contrast, we see Bloom's reaching out to others, ranging from the personal, his love for his daughter Millie and his wife Molly, to the public, his forceful denunciation of persecution and injustice when he stands up to the hateful citizen in Cyclops, chapter 12. And we should add that his love for his dead son Rudy invoked multiple times and in a variety of ways throughout the novel, ironically has greater force than Simon Dedalus's solicitude for his own children who are alive. 
Indeed, that heroic exchange in Cyclops where Bloom urges that there is something that is the very opposite, this is a quote, of insult and hatred, something that is really life, life for men and women. He says that, and a man in the pub asks him, that is Bloom, uh, if he knows what that is. He says, what? Uh, one of the listeners just says, what? What is that, that thing that's the opposite of insult and hatred? And Bloom, unlike Stephen, knows the word and replies with directness and simplicity. Love, I mean the opposite of hatred. You could not get more unjoycean in terms of no uh, uh, adornment, no complexity, no detour. Love, I mean the opposite of hatred. And I think we can all agree that that's a lesson that is still unlearned by millions of people today. Uh, and Joyce does mean that to be one of the great revelations in the novel, if you have the patience to read through it and let those moments leap out at you. The citizen then mocks Bloom as a second St. Paul, the new apostle to the Gentile. But the Christ quoting converted Bloom, like St. Paul a convert, points out quote, Christ was a Jew like me. And although the end of the chapter parodies biblical prose in having, quote, Ben Bloom Elijah, amid the clouds of angels ascend to the glory of the brightness, uh, he's taken up into heaven on a chariot like Elijah. Joyce is mocking the style of the Bible, but not the fact of Bloom's goodness. The thing about Bloom is he could fart at the end of one chapter and ascend to glory at the end of another. His menschkeit, you can look that up, it's a Gaelic word, you, you can find it, uh, which we have seen in various instances and episodes throughout the Ulysses, his basic humanity, his menschness uh, is part of the message, absolutely core message uh, of the novel. So I will conclude, as Joyce does, um, with Molly Bloom and her extraordinary interior monologue. While Stephen asked a question he seemed not able to answer, and his mother doesn't answer it, Molly answers questions that have been asked, as it were, off camera. Her quiet but repeated yes uttered no fewer than 20 times on the last two pages of the novel is given without being preceded by a question. And that yes is understood to be in response to at least three different requests from Bloom. That she make him breakfast in bed. He never did a thing like that before, she says at the beginning of the chapter. That they have sex in the past. And that she marry him in the long and complicated memory she has of the day out on Howe Hill. That is, breakfast, sex, marriage. It has a domestic, a biological, and a social dimension. That tripartite uh, element that we see in the three main characters of the book, and it's being divided into three parts, the Telemachiad, the wanderings, the homecoming. That the last yes, has its initial letter capitalized, suggests that Joyce intends it to be understood as a kind of yes to life. If the unproductive encounter between Bloom and Stephen in the preceding chapter, Ithaca, is marked by the interrogative, questions and answers, questions and answers, in a kind of sterile way, Molly's mostly bedbound monologue is suffused with the affirmative, with its circular movement from its opening yes to its concluding capital Y, yes. And again, some people have made the point that the Y, um, especially a capital Y, uh, is an image of a woman's groin. You could say it'd be an image of a man's groin too, if you imagine the creases in uh, between the thighs and the torso and the line between the legs. 
but of course, uh, a man's groin is complicated by genitalia and the woman does not. Uh, that may seem like a wacky idea. It may seem like another version of outjoicing Joyce, uh, but it has a ancient Greek forebear in that uh, Oedipus is told that he will meet his fate, which is to kill his father and eventually sleep with his mother uh, uh, at a place where three roads meet and three roads meeting in that idea of a why. And many uh, commenters on the great story of Oedipus Rex say that that's an image also of his having been born of the woman that he is then going to violate through marriage unbeknownst to him that she is his mother. So there may be something to that. So what F.R. Evis, uh, F.R. Levis failed to see is that Joyce, by means of his magnificent detours of style and substance, and again, I just wanna say, when I say a detour here, I mean, he could say directly, love is the opposite of hate. Just as Picasso was quite capable of drawing an absolutely realistic portrait of a human face. But instead, like Picasso, Joyce goes out of his way he takes the longest way round and complicates our reading experience for the reasons I've mentioned already, to enrich the experience, to tell us it's really important, maybe uh, more important than we might realize if we were reading it casually. And despite all that, he nonetheless delivers us home, that's what a detour should do, to the great moral truths that are at the core of the best 19th and 20th century British novels. Thank you. And I'm not leaving early. I intentionally time this so that if there are questions that can be asked while we're still assembled, Zoom-wise, uh, I can answer them so other people can hear them. I've gotten some number of questions uh, after the fact. I don't mind them. But of course, those that question and answer is more private. So Michael, I'll invite you to channel any questions to me in the usual way. Okay, great. Well, thanks. First of all, thanks, Mark. That was really, that was really excellent. Uh, very insightful. Uh, someone is asking, saying and asking, this seems such a love song to Dublin and its inhabitants. And much of Dublin is a love song to Joyce. Why then do you think he exiled himself? Yeah, so uh, much of Dublin is a, is a love song to Joyce after Joyce died. Uh, and I, I, I don't say this in a snide way. Uh, they were not happy with him for much of his life because they felt that he made a career out of running Dublin down. Uh, and the reason he left Ireland uh, that is uh, explained in, um, uh, in Portrait of an Artist is uh, Joyce felt that the artist in Ireland, and he in particular, were bound by three nets. He used the image of a net that would stop a bird from flying. Uh, and after all, his name Daedalus invokes Icarus and the idea of flying, human being flying by means of artifice. Um, he felt that he was bound by the nets of uh, religion, uh, that the Irish religion, and I'm calling it Irish religion, that particular brand of Catholicism, was completely opposed to any sense of sexuality. There's a scene in um, Portrait of an Artist where a woman is holding a baby at a half open cottage door. That is the top half is open and the bottom half is closed. This could be quite realistically true. You let the top half open for air, you keep the bottom to keep the animals and dirt out of your home. Uh, and that it was an image of the fact that you could recognize a woman's sexuality in terms of her maternity. She has breasts she nurtures babies, but you don't want to get involved in the muck that's below the waist. And, and he's quite serious about uh, that what uh, Irish religion did was negate uh, portions of life. And Joyce believed absolutely throw all the doors open. Women have breasts, but they also have vaginas. Remember how in Molly's monologue, she's put off by the fact that her gynecologist insists in referring to her female parts as a vagina and the word irritates her. So he wants to leave because Irish Catholicism doesn't promote 
the free spirit of an artist. And he recognizes that another net that's pulling him back is nationality. Because although he had a kind of patriotism in the sense of love of the country uh, and its people, he, re he resented that Irish nationalism was so partisan. And as he put it, so extreme that if you wore the wrong color tie, you might be hurt on the street because orange and green meant something other than just a color. And he did not feel that an artist could work within the rigidity of that kind of binary mindset. And then the third net is the English language itself. That is the language of the people who oppressed uh, Ireland. And as I said in the first meeting, he never contemplated writing in Gaelic because he understood that to do so would limit his fame. But he did the next best thing. He wrote in English, but not my English or yours, Michael. He wrote in an English that's filled with detours, that is Joycean, uh, that confounds us as if he's creating a new language. And all of these things are kind of parabolas, again, a word that means that arc, but also a parable. In writing a different kind of English, in finding religious um, reverence in non-religious things, um, and in um, language, uh, Oh, and in celebrating a nationalism that's people-based and not uh, nation-based. So he loved the Irish people, but he made an immature mistake. He sincerely felt when he worked on Dubliners and then published it, a book that I have infinite regard for. It's my favorite of Joyce's books. I've taught it with book groups and high school classes and college courses, uh, dozens, maybe scores of times. He actually felt that if he wrote a book that showed the people of Dublin how um, paralyzed, how petty, small-minded, stagnated they were, they would get up the next morning and say, thank you, Jimmy, for showing us the error of our ways. We're going to be better people, and we will rise to be one of the great European capitals the way you always thought that Dublin should be. That's not how they responded. Uh, they excoriated him in the book. It was censored. It was burned. Uh, people thought it was incredibly disrespectful. They did not get him. Now, he's celebrated throughout Dublin and Ireland by many people, of course, who get him. I'm, I, I don't want to, again, seem snide. But like any national hero of any background, many people like him because they think it's important to like him, that he's good for Ireland, who have never read him. Uh, and I think he and I will remain untroubled about that. Okay. Okay, someone writes, I'm curious about the Circe chapter. It's so long, seems to be a kind of cards on the table type of chapter. Do you put any additional problem solving weight as it were on it? Is it a more revealing chapter than the others? Or do you see it on a par with the, the others in that way? Well, I do think it's a high note. Uh, it, it is, uh, in my edition, 148 pages. The, uh, in my edition, uh, which is this edition, the average, average length of a chapter of Ulysses, not counting Circe, is 29 pages. And Circe is 148. Uh, it is itself 23% of the entire novel. Uh, so it's meant to be a master episode. Uh, it's the only portion of the novel that has been produced as a play and a movie separately. And a lot goes on in it, um, partly because it has Stephen and Bloom, uh, the dead son Rudy, the dead mother, uh, and a cast of not hundreds, but a lot of people. It also has a supernatural or as I said earlier, hallucinogenic dimension, which seems different because it's rendered visible than just stream of consciousness. So when Bloom or Stephen or Molly remember something or imagine something, we don't see it actually rendered as drama. But what Joyce understood about the power of drama, what the ancient Greeks understood about the power of drama, is that you if you have a guy who tells you he's Oedipus and he realizes that he's just learn that he's killed his father and slept with his mother, 
that's going to be much more palpable in its emotions than it would be if you just read about that in a uh, narrative piece. And so Joyce saves for late in the novel, but not its very end, um, this explosion just before we turn to the homecoming of all the psychological, sexual, political feelings involved in really two sets of parents and sons. And at the same time, fathers and sons, at the same time, he does a remarkable thing. He transforms Bloom into a Bella character and a Bello character. And those words can mean both war and beauty. And it's striking that Bloom inhabits both genders in this fantasy because one of the hallmarks of Shakespearean comedy is that those characters like Viola in Twelfth Night, in my mind, the height of uh, Shakespeare's success in female characterization is so full of humanity that Viola can play a man persuasively and have a woman fall in love with her and at the same time be herself and have a man fall in love with her. Uh, she's not just play acting, although of course many of Shakespeare's plays are indirectly about play acting. She's inhabiting the entire realm of human existence, male and female. It's significant that when Bloom says uh, what's, what's true of life of every, all the people, he, Joyce has him say of men and women. Uh, so Bloom gets to play more than one part and it ends with this notion uh, that uh, the grief that um, Bloom has been both engaging and avoiding during the day and for the many years since Rudy's death is going to get channeled into his solicitation uh, for Stephen, who effectively rejects it. So you have a loving father who doesn't find a, a responsive son. Now, there's a lot more going on in it. But I would say first and foremost, it's the power of what it means when you take a story and you render it into drama. It's worth remembering that before there was any other, any fiction uh, in uh, Western civilization, uh, the first art form was poetry, odes and hymns, uh, songs to gods, prayers for the harvest. The second art form was drama by the ancient Greeks, originally with just two characters. Uh, fiction comes along a lot later, and you need effectively a middle class to care about reading about regular people. Got it. So this actually picks up uh, on, on uh, part of something you just mentioned. Is there, is there a meaningful connection between Stephen's theory of Hamlet and its focus on paternal relationships and his own difficult relationship between his father and his late mother? Would it be too hasty to imagine a connection between Hamlet haunted by the ghost of his father and Stephen haunted by the memory of his mother's passing? Uh, no, in fact, uh, uh, if, if the person who saw that did that without any external help, very apt reading, uh, I said in one of the earlier meetings, which is not to say, one of my earlier lectures, which is not to say that's what put this idea in your head, but uh, in some ways Hamlet is as influential a text to the understanding of the Stephen section, uh, the Stephen dimension of Ulysses as uh, the Odyssey. Yes, uh, Hamlet's uh, burden is that he's been asked by uh, his father, a dead king, uh, to commit the horrible act of killing a king. His father uh, was killed by his brother Claudius. Claudius killed a king and now Hamlet's being invited by his father to commit the same act. If that wasn't bad enough, Hamlet, unlike Macbeth, who is a warrior, unlike Othello, who is a warrior, Hamlet is a scholar. And he's being asked to do something that if he were a different character, if, if he were a character in Jacobean drama, which is very bloody and focused on revenge, he'd be lickety split to do what his father asked him. But he's not a warrior, he's a scholar, like Stephen, that is a man of intellect rather than of action. And he's partly um, uh, made inert by not knowing how to render things into action. So uh, Hamlet's complicated 
uh, that is the play and the character, because he may have feelings towards his mother that are not uh, um, appropriate, but even if he doesn't, he feels that his mother is complicit, if not in the murder, and it seemed pretty clear she wasn't, in the thoughtlessness that she jumped into a marriage bed of another man so quickly, and she seemed not interested in invest investigating whether some uh, uh, ill will or evil action had befallen her first husband. So the uh, kind of hothouse drama in Hamlet of son, dead father, grieving but maybe complicit mother, and an uncle that is both now a surrogate father and a king is certainly something that weighs throughout um, uh, Shakespeare, the theory of Shakespeare, who had a son named Hamlet. And in, the, in Shakespeare's time, they wouldn't have made any great distinction in spelling between Hamlet and Hamlet. That may seem odd to you, but in the same way that people spell um, given names like Phyllis or Claire in different ways, it wouldn't have been an odd thing. So yes, there's a lot going on uh, in Stephen's story uh, with um, Hamlet, the play Hamlet. Just to, just to expand on that a little bit, do uh, you have any further general comments of what, what you think Joyce thinks of Shakespeare, sort of in an overall sense? Oh, uh, uh, I would say, I think it's fair to say that Joyce thinks that Shakespeare is one of the English writers worthy of being compared to Joyce. Uh, some people have suggested uh, that the great writer of the Renaissance world uh, in all countries, and of course this is probably suggested by somebody who spoke English, was Shakespeare, that the great writer of the medieval world was Dante, that the great writer of the 20th century was Joyce, and there's a fervent debate among who of the many writers would be the great writer of the long period after the Renaissance up until the 20th century, you might think of as sort of enlightenment, romanticism, there are lots of competition. But, but Joyce would have felt that like Dante and, uh, and uh, Shakespeare, he deserved to be in that pantheon. And you know, um, Shakespeare uh, made a lot of his own words, he made them up, he created a language for himself. If you were to look up in Wikipedia, a list of words coined by Shakespeare, it would amaze you, I think. Uh, he also was very active in punning and in doing things that most people who listen to his plays would not have noticed, even some readers do not notice. And if you say, why, why was he making all these kinds of jokes or puns when he had to know that people would miss them? He did it because he's Shakespeare and that's the nature of his genius. I'll make the comparison to Hanna-Barbera, uh, the two men who created so many cartoons in my youth. Uh, I can remember uh, that there's an episode of some cartoon series where they have to investigate a robbery from the Boomsier, that is Boomsier mansion. What's been stolen? The tiara. And one of the characters says, you mean they've stolen the tiara Boomsier? Now I was eight and even I knew that that was a joke I would never understand. Why did they write that? The guys who wrote that, maybe the women who wrote it, but not likely in the 50s, because that's the nature of genius. In Hamlet, two characters see the ghost. And when they see the ghost on the third night, they bring Horatio with them because they feel like they need a scholar to give them advice. And when they report to Hamlet, one of the characters says, uh, I may get the names wrong, By Bernardo and I, two nights together, now you could read that as two nights with a K, they're centuries, or two nights and, two nights together saw the ghost. Horatio, the third night, either with the K or without, saw it as well. And you say to yourself, oh, so that's just trying to be clever. No, that's Shakespeare having such an expansive understanding of the range of language that he can't stop himself from making that kind of double meaning. Fantastic. Like Joyce. Yeah, so here's, a, here's a comment on, uh, or a question on Molly. Could you comment a bit on Molly's meanderings about the use of Spanish and her time in Spain 
she seems a bit wild starting at age 15. Is she happy? Is she happy with her life? Is she happy with Bloom? Okay, so that's a lot of questions. Yeah. Uh, especially for the end of a series. Uh, and I think some of the final questions are a matter of reader's interpretation. Sure. I will say that um, uh, Joyce uh, thinks of uh, the East, uh, that is where Gibraltar is relative to Ireland, as the frontier of the European continent. And so his having Mali inhabit Gibraltar uh, and also having the mix of uh, Arabian and Spanish and continental background makes her exotic. I'm putting that word in quotation because it's a word that uh, many people see with a kind of disdain like oriental and they should because it denatures somebody like asking somebody who speaks a language you've never heard before, oh, say something in that language as if you want them to perform for you because they're interesting. Uh, but he did see her as a character representing the sort of uh, gateway to Europe, which is the area of the world that Joyce is hoping to make his fame. He went to the continent. He spent a lot of his time in Italy and, and Paris. Uh, and he hoped that, really hoped, in, in, I think in his innocent way, that his writings would inspire the people of Dublin to put aside the alcohol, the dreaminess, the reverence for a kind of folklore, pre-adolescent past, uh, the, uh, the, the, the being in love with nostalgia, and that they would rise to the level of being a great country. That's where his patrioti patriotism showed itself. And of course, by making her uh, a product of a different culture, Joyce gets to play again with language, uh, as he does constantly in this novel, and excessively in Finnegan's Wake. Finnegan's Wake takes what happens in this novel and raises it exponentially. Okay. So one quick question, and then if you have time, I have one question I want to ask you myself, and that, that's probably it. Um, Someone reacted when you were when you were referring to Dubliners, just ask, do you have a favorite tale from that from that book of short stories? Uh, yes, that's easy. The Dead, which is the culminating story, uh, is, in my view, one of the great wonders of English literature. I think it's one of the great things uh, ever written. When I count my blessings, as I do pretty regularly, uh, beyond my personal life, my children, my friends, the things that are important to me, including events like this one. I count uh, things like NPR uh, and the dead uh, as one of the great uh, accomplishments in human civilization. I think it's a masterful story and I have done programs uh, multiple hours on the dead by itself. It is the longest uh, and uh, fullest of the remarkable stories in that book. And it's meant to be a culmination of a novel made up of short stories, sometimes called a cycle novel, where the earlier stories represent different phases of development, children, adolescent, adult people, people of culture. And the final uh, episode of the dead um, is a culmination of all of Dublin life. It's a masterpiece. If you've never read it, uh, you can read it apart from uh, Dubliners very easily, uh, and in the fullness of time, uh, I may be somewhere again uh, talking about uh, the dead, which is one of my great um, activities. Thanks. Hey, thank you. So here's my question, Mark. So at one point in the in the four in the four lectures, maybe more than once, you you made a point that with sort of more let's just call it realistic novels, where you get lost in the novel and you actually are beginning to feel like the character in the novel is a real person. Whereas in Ulysses, because you're constantly being reminded you're reading a novel, you're constantly being reminded this artificial construct that that kind of doesn't happen. But now having just finished this again for, uh, for the latest time, and maybe because it's fresh in my mind, I, I feel like I got to know Bloom almost better than any character in any book I've ever read. I would hope so. And there's no contradiction, Michael. I see where you're going. So let me say that uh, in the hands of a master, to, to do these disruptive, these detouring and runs and create a different way to see the character 
ultimately results in a greater understanding of his humanity. And I'll give you a perfect example. Those of you who know Art Spiegelman's masterpiece, the two volumes of his homage to his father, a concentration camp survivor, two graphic novels, Maus, the German word for Maus, M-A-U-S, volume one and volume two. If you've had the good fortune to read and experience those two remarkable books, you know that the wackiness at first of having Jews portrayed as mice uh, and Poles as pigs and French as frogs and whatever, uh, you read the entire book and you don't see a human face anywhere because it's a cartoon with uh, terribly poignant uh, evocations of humanity despite the cartoon cartoonish quality. And you realize when you're done reading the book, you have an insight into his father who in only one place is figured by a photograph of his father as a younger man. You experience his mouse caricature father as a human being in the same way that many of us can see a caricature of ourselves, well, not ourselves, we, we resist ourselves. We can see a good character, characterist make a distorted picture of someone we know well and immediately know that's my uncle. Now my uncle may not be happy with it because he doesn't think his nose is that long, but we all understand that a great artist can distort and represent accurately at the same time. And that's exactly what Joyce does, absolutely. Yeah, and it, what, it, what it brought me back to was a comment, and it, I don't know if this is synchronicity or trying to be, a, be make a pun here, but a comment from another Bloom, Harold Bloom, who, uh, who said in an interview 10 years ago or so, probably said it more than once, that one of the reasons you read great books is to meet more people. And the experience of reading this book, I think it gives you an experience of really meeting a handful of people and in the space of their 24 hours and your 15 hours, you really got to know them. So Michael, you've given me my closing line, even though we didn't work this out in advance. <laughs> that idea of reading novels about people who don't exist in order to meet more people, that's another version of the longest way round is the shortest way home. Sure. If you want to get more knowledge, more understanding of human life, you cannot meet a real Anna Karenina, but you can read about her and countless others. And people who love reading fiction and literature for their personal development and not just for entertainment, and again, there's no conflict there, know that that's right. I have connections to Gabriel Conroy in The Dead or Greta Conroy what, that I don't have to most of the people who are listening in on this Zoom, uh, a few of whom I know because I can see their names among the participants, but all of you are presumably real and I don't have any experience of you and Gabriel and his wife are not real and they are in my heart and mind uh, forever. It's a remarkable thing, it's a gift. I think that's a great way to conclude this. Uh, Mark, this has been fantastic. Um, and uh, I, I thank you very much for putting all the effort in and, uh, and sharing all these insights with us. Uh, I'm sure we'll be, we'll be in touch soon about our next, uh, aside from you coming back in two weeks, uh, we'll, we'll be having some more further discussions of more things for you to come to talk to us about, uh, hopefully in the near future. Thank you. And let me just say to clarify, the, the program two weeks from today is looking at uh, Fitzgerald's accomplishment, especially in the 20s, through the lens of a collection of short stories called Tales of the Jazz Age. So a book. Uh, and I encourage you, if you want to come to that Zoom program and get the most out of it, to read those very eclectic short stories, Tales of the Jazz Age. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Oh, I just want, and I just want to add that, uh, and Lauren, you jump in and correct me if, if we're out of them. We still have copies of Tales of the Jazz Age for free if you just come to our drive-up window. Is that, is that we still have some, Lauren? You read my mind, Michael. Yes, we do have some copies left. First come, first serve. So Monday, drive through the drive through and we'll give you your free copy. Great. Well, thanks again, everybody, for taking your time with us. Enjoy the rest of the weekend. And thanks again, Mark. We'll stay in touch. Thank you. Bye, everyone.